I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. I'm so glad you could join us again for this week's episode of the Parenting Aces podcast. Coming at you from Atlanta, Georgia. We have gorgeous weather here. It's hot and humid, but uh, beats the rain, so can't complain. I'm really excited to chat with Coach Jim Harp this week, and I've known Jim for quite a while, but not really known him, just kind of known him enough to say hello when we've seen each other at tournaments or whatever. But now I feel like I really have a lot more insight into his philosophy of coaching what he hopes to achieve with the players that he works with, and how he works with families to ensure success for everybody involved in this whole crazy tennis journey. So I'm not going to keep you all too long. I just want to remind you that if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or wherever you like to get your podcasts and if you like what you hear we'd love for you to leave us a review and also if you are interested in being a sponsor of the parenting aces podcast we would love to have you on board so if you could just shoot me an email to lisa at parentingaces.com i will get back in touch with you and we'll talk about what's involved in sponsoring this weekly show to help parents do a better job out there of helping their kids reach their goals when it comes to tennis. So thank you for tuning in again, and enjoy my conversation with Jim Harp. I'm with Jim Harp, an Atlanta area junior development coach, high-performance coach, all-around good guy. Jim, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast this week. Thanks for having me, Lisa. So you've been doing this coaching gig for many years now. I have been seeing you at tournaments since my kids started playing, um, you know, a long time ago. And I would love for you to share with the Parenting Aces audience some of the things that you feel are important for us parents to know. And by that, I mean, you know, things like what we should be looking for in a coach, what we should be looking for in a program, what we should be looking for in terms of guidance and things like that. And so I'm going to just be quiet and let you talk to us about all the things that make your program so special. Oh, that's, that's kind. And, and that's a good, those are great questions. I think, you know, when we look at, um, first of all, you want a sincere coach. Uh, and you want an educated coach, and, and I think you want some experience for sure, somebody who's been down the, the road before. But even if they haven't, I think a sincere and holistic approach with with uh, with some background in development is is big. I've I've spent the better part of my career um, educating and listening and learning and and collaborating with coaches from all over the world. Uh, you're never done learning. Uh, in, in fact, I think the more you know the more you want to know or the the less you understand and the more you want to know, I guess it makes sense. But in terms of a development program, I think a truly sincere approach to development is is very, very important, and that's from the ground up, from the ability to create uh, an athlete, a young athlete, and um, all the things that go with it, the nutrition, the the time spent, the commitment – um, from the coach's standpoint, they should understand the various ages and stages and, and windows that pop up and go away in development. Um, a program that has a fitness fit, I think, is very important. Uh, my work with the ITPA and, and Dr. Kovacs and certifying uh, in some sports science has given me tremendous background and, and at least a base level of understanding of where these young athletes are. Uh, as well as PTR's Master of Performance, and, and it's all, all of its performance programs um, have helped me tremendously in, in gaining more and more knowledge and passing that on to the coaches who work with us and, and encouraging them to, to gain more knowledge. And for parents, um, athlete and person first, or person and athlete first. Let's, let's have a, a young person who has good manners, uh, has the ability to look you in the eye and introduce themselves, uh, understands rules and standards of, of daily programming and, and wants, to, wants to do their best and understands what doing their best is, 
having um, a program that sees to all of the needs of the young person being explained to the parent. Not everybody is meant to be Roger Federer, but every 12-year-old, every 11-year-old, every 10-year-old I have is ready to be Serena or Roger or or whomever is on the tour they look up to, and we want that. We, we want that shine to stay on the game. And, um, and oftentimes I think parents do put the cart ahead of the horse. Sorry for the cliche, but um, – They start wanting to build a tennis player prior to building an athlete and prior to building a young person who can listen and learn and takes in knowledge conceptually and then wants to earn things. And and then that, you know, we could speak the entire podcast on just that alone. But but typically when parents first come in, we explain our process and then everybody wants to know if they're a good fit. And for me, a good fit is, is that, is somebody, a young person who has really good manners, who's willing to buy in for the long run and develop from the beginning to the end very holistically and, and trying to, to get as many parts in there as we can before they go to college. I don't know if that answers your questions. Well, I mean, that, that's definitely a jumping off point. And, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and I never really know how to answer it, in the best way is this whole question of process versus results and the way that our governing body has set up the junior comp system in the U.S. is very results driven. I mean, you have to win matches and earn ranking points in order to progress to the next level of tournament. And so it seems to be this really tough kind of balance to achieve you know, when when I'm preaching on parenting aces and when I have guests on, you know, that are top-level coaches who are saying we've got to focus on the process, we've got to focus on the process, and then the results will come. And then the parent says, but my kid wants to go to that next level. You know, how are they going to get there if, if they're not getting results, if they're not winning matches and earning points? How do you address that when, when a parent comes to you with that question? Yeah, and it and it happens relatively frequently. I think more and more these days, the developmental process is, is more and more obvious, though, too. If you spend enough time creating ground-based force and, and you know what the stroke looks like and you know what, what common movement parameters are and what competencies need to be reached, you're going to hit those numbers and you're going to hit those marks and you're going to get those wins. And at the beginning of the game, you know, you may have to climb up, but we have young people in our program now who are – 13, 14 years old who've only been playing a year or less uh, at any sort of an elite level, and, and they're not elite at all. But their their peak time is going to be 17, 18, uh, for juniors anyway, whereas I've got some early specialization players who are already very highly nationally ranked. But you still have to hit the marks. You've got to hit the competencies. Can you load properly? Do you have a good contact point? Is the shape of your swing good? Do you get in and out of corners correctly? If you hit those numbers the results come. You just The results may not be here this year. And, again, that, that goes back to the coach and the parent being on the same page. Um, I do a lot of developmental planning uh, and cycling. Our entire year is cycled out in eight-week uh, meso cycles so that we hit a, as well as we can in groups. And, of course, individually uh, they're monitored developmentally. But those are things that can be hit that are they're not so much quantifiable as you know what they look like at an elite level and, and then there's windows of acceptability and, and possibly, you know, Jack Sox forehand would be, and I don't want to throw him under the bus, but that's one of those windows of acceptability. He creates a tremendous force on the shot. They went with it. It's an amazing ball. Um, and it works at a very, very elite level. Um, you may see that in your, in your group as a coach and, and have a need to understand whether or not that's going to work for a young player at 10, 11, 12 years old and which direction you're going to go with it. But I, I do think you can develop within the systems that are out there. Um, and, and I do think if you know what you're doing and you can get the parent on the same page, we've been successful with it, um, then, then you, can, you can be successful like that. We've, we have a young man right now who was with me from 8 to 16 years old who never won a round at our state qualifier. And now he's, uh, he should be after Kalamazoo near 100 in the country. 
and that's a tremendous um, it's a tremendous mark towards achieving competency through long term developmental process. And as long as we're we are on process, it can work. But you can get caught up in the points if you're not careful. And there are places you're going to need to win if you want to track to that national level. Right. Well, let's use your your young man that you just mentioned as an example, and and let's just call him Robert because I'm pulling a name out of thin air. Um, so he didn't. Robert didn't win a mat, a single match at the qualifier, and he was able to play Kalamazoo this year. What happened? Was there something physical? Was there something mental? Was it something? with his family, you know, what happened that, that, cause that's a huge leap. I mean, to get to Kalamazoo sure. from our section is very, very tough. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's all of those things. Uh, from the beginning, I had exceptional cooperation with his parents. Um, we built a game for the future. Uh, uh, dad and mom were very involved and, in, and, in, and in understanding we met a lot eight years old, nine, 10, 11, all the way through 16 years old. It was a very specific game style, very specific developmental process. They bought in uh, at 16. Um, he had finaled the uh, state qualifier and was a seeded player at the Southerns that year. So he really had reached one of his early peaks after not being super relevant uh, at that level forever. And, and, so, so of the milestones I mentioned before, uh, reaching movement uh, competencies, reaching um, contact points and shape of the swing and loads and unloads, so many things were put in place. <clears throat> Pardon me. At 16, they decided he wanted to travel more. Um, I actually went over to – I went over across seas with him for an ITF, and they decided they wanted to do more of that. They went south to Florida and started going every day to training and um, – and live in training, and it worked out great. The coach did a super job developing him the rest of the way, and um, it was really long-term development. You know, the LTAD, the longer long-term athletic development model that's out there. We used it. Um, it was a specific game style. Everybody bought in. Hard-working player knew the answer to all the questions. Paid attention every day. Outworked everybody. Always saw the long-term goal. And um, and then yes, you know all those things you mentioned before. Uh, parents involved well, mentally, you know, went up notch. Physically, tremendous did tremendous work physically. Um, and as we know, we peak in those teenage years post puberty. Pre puberty, we're putting in uh, things. We're putting in pieces. We're putting parts of the puzzle together. And if your DNA is there, if your work ethic is there, if your culture is there you may have a shot at another level. And I think he's got a shot at, at quite a few other levels to come. Uh, we will see. Mm-hmm. But it was a great, mm-hmm. it's a great story. I use it all the time because it was a process story. And, um, and I am married to process and performance. So how did you prevent him from burning out? Because we all know that when you bang your head against the wall enough times, it's easy to just throw your hands up and say, I'm done. So going to the state qualifier year after year and not winning a match, I mean, to, to have the fortitude to keep working toward even that goal of let me get past the first round, I mean, that's pretty intense. Yeah, it was tremendous. And um, at 14 and a half-ish years old, it's going back a few years now, a couple years now, um, changed the game style to a more forward game and more aggressive. We got forward, um, got some free points. Because, again, you know, when we look at this particular athlete, uh, he was a late mature. And um, so, therefore, the you know, we always knew Dad was fairly tall and we expected him to grow and things like that. But the, um, the late maturation process, so we knew he, the doubles were coming a little easier. So we got forward a little more, got a few more free points. But I, we had a lot of fun at practice. We laughed a lot. Uh, I tried to be mentor, friend, confidant. We talked about pressure from everywhere that comes as a young athlete, parents, school, girlfriends, you name it, um, peer groups. We chatted about most everything. Some days we worked hard. Other days we uh, we took a ride and got lunch, ice cream, laughed a lot, made a lot of jokes. And then, you know, like I said, other days we dug in and worked hard and 
and yelled and, and didn't yell and, and everything that goes in between the, those pieces. So um, at the end of the day, I trusted and believed in his future and never doubted him and tried to be that person for all of my kids. If, if it's your dream, it's my dream. And, um, and, and I think mom and dad were there too. And they did the same thing. And it was always a matter of belief and long-term vision and everybody bought in. I, I wish it was like that all of the time. Um, but there, there's lots of things that can go wrong in there too. And just in his case, they, they all went really, really right. You know? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things that can go wrong for sure. <laughs> and I, again, I mean, I just think it, it speaks to that young, young man's fortitude that, that he stuck with it um, through those periods of, I'm sure frustration and, you know, questioning whether he was on the right path. So that's awesome. You know, another thing that that keeps coming up, and, and you and I are involved in a lot of online communities together. I see your name as much as anybody's um, contributing to these conversations. But one of the, the things that comes up a lot, a lot, a lot is this whole question of, quote, regular school versus homeschool or virtual school. And I'm curious what your philosophy is on that and why. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I always try to take an open, you know, I think it's been described as a holistic approach to it all. My preference is some level of, you know, social life. So I do like, um, I do like conventional school or, or a private school, whatever, you know, a traditional school, if you will, at least to some degree. Um, I think kids enjoy it and, and have to, um, you know, kind of fight their way through all of the, the, the peaks and valleys that are our daily life. Um, but for some, I have a young lady I taught who was always homeschooled. She was an amazing human being, always did great, ended up at West Point um, and, and played tennis there and was just an exceptional person. Um, and she had always been homeschooled, and, and her parents and her are, are close friends for life. Um, for some people, it works really well. I just think if, if you're going to homeschool for the purpose of tennis, I just think you should be really, really, really careful um, because what you're taking away from the child uh, for what you're giving, I don't know if it's worth it. If it's for the dream of playing on the tour, I would, I would say it's the wrong thing to do. If it's because you want to give them an opportunity to live a well-rounded life and and you think there can be plenty of socialization and and other things that they need, then, then I guess good on you. I, I, and it works here. We have a small homeschool program. Most of my kids, the majority of my program goes three to six, and my kids are out. They all take an online class and get here by three o'clock. That's the majority of it. I I think it it works for some, but it's got to be a good balance. Uh, It's hard for me to speak to it uh, because I've seen it work really well on both sides. Um, I just think you got to do what's best for the child and having a a well-rounded varied life with lots of opportunities and experiences. And if you're, if you're meant to be a tennis player, the amount of time you spend on it is far less important than the investment in whatever time you spend on it. Uh, does that make sense? Well, I was just getting ready to say, can you elaborate on that statement, please? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can get out of a player in 30 minutes sometimes what it may take another player uh, months to get, um, depending on the level of the athlete. And even more important sometimes, the level of engagement. And often I'm I'm asked to help with a player who is struggling in some aspect of their game. They haven't been here before. Um, They've heard that maybe I can help, and they'll come in, and I'll usually say, I don't know if I can help, but I'll try. And I'll listen to the player begin to regurgitate and repeat cliche after cliche of how they were taught and what they should be doing and what should be happening, and it's completely irrelevant to the moment. So the player is not really focused. They are in another place um, and don't, and, and at that point are not understanding what is being asked of them specifically you know, it could be something like learning to hit better from your rear leg or holding your unit turn or, or whatever it is. They're just not there with you. And getting them to connect cognitively to the moment is, is massively important. And so then you take a player who's just very mature for their age, completely bought into what's happening in front of them, and they'll knock something out like that in five or ten minutes. 
And it, like I said, it could take months with somebody else, but in that player's case, is five or ten minutes. So, so I think that's that's really an important thing. You don't have to spend three hours a day homeschooling, um, or three hours a day in homeschool program playing tennis first, doing school in the middle of the day, and coming back for three more hours. Some players can get that same amount of work done in three hours total, and and knock out both tennis and fitness. And I've got I know many people, many friends of mine, um, who played on the tour, who did not spend six hours a day playing tennis. But then again, there's many stories that, that they did. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't mean to mince words there, but I think both systems work, but it does depend on the player. But the value and the intensity of your time put in is more important than the number of hours put in, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. I mean, I, I agree with that too, Quant, quality over quantity. And uh, it takes a commitment from the coach to stay focused and it takes a commitment from the player to stay focused in order to to achieve more in less time, for sure. What is your particular, your personal background in the game, Jim? How did you get involved in the sport? <laughs> so I was a, uh, was a I was a athlete, played everything, um, was thrown into a summer camp young, and had a knack to run around and make balls, and started playing competitively young. Played till I was twelve, quit until I was 19 and then walked on to a junior college and was able to, uh, within a year, make All-American at a junior college, a Division One junior college here in town, Perimeter College. Back then, I think it was called the Cab College. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, we were we were three in the country by the time we were done. It was, it was a good quality run. I wish I'd played more. There's lots of reasons why I didn't. Um, but I think more importantly, um, you know, I, I did work once I got to college and, and upped my game and sought out good coaching and, and learned a lot and, and was able to um, to play a lot of levels after that and continue to, to compete with some very, very nice level players uh, through college. And so what possessed you to get into coaching? <laughs> That's a good story, too. Um, I needed a job, uh, quite frankly. Right. I didn't okay. have a job. I didn't know what to do. I was... Uh, confused what did you major in direction. college? Uh, English literature. Oh, so well, I, uh, okay. I really didn't, yeah, <laughs> teaching was probably going to teach no matter what. But I really didn't know which direction I was going to go, and I reached out to John Niemeyer here. You, I'm sure you remember John. He was a, yep. a cornerstone of, of building the Atlanta tennis area. And uh, he just gave me a job in an inner city program working out in, in the county um, with inner city youth coaching. And as I was as I was doing it, I was like, wow, I really like this. And uh, from there, I sought out a really good coach in Gary Grohlman, who helped me develop my game and develop my teaching skills. So he was definitely my mentor uh, when I was very young and for many, many years. And um, and so once I kind of got in there, I started to realize that I, I felt like I had a very natural knack for relating to players and the game and mechanics. And um, 30 years later, I'm, I'm still here. That's fantastic. I I love that because, you know, I've had people on the podcast before who have similar stories, but maybe who, you know, after college, they went to work in an area that that they had gotten their degree in, whatever that might be, and then realized pretty quickly, this is not nearly as fun as being on the tennis court and (laughs) earning money that way, and, and have circled back to the tennis world. So, Interesting that you left for such a long time and then found your way back in college. Um, you don't hear that story very often. I was fortunate. I think, you know, and it's one of the reasons that I, I try to believe in a lot of my athletes, um, because I, I do believe if you if you have a dream um, that you can make it come true. And uh, I think it's very important for coaches to buy in and then, of course, teach the habits that it's going to take. I didn't always have those habits, as as most people didn't. You know, it's rare, but um, I did have the athletic ability, and so therefore I was able to uh, transcend some of the mistakes that I'd made. But um, I really enjoyed competing. I enjoyed playing, and I I was a quick learn, and um, and it was great to get back into the game, and it it really changed my life, and it's given me uh, an incredible life. I mean, we have a a fun program. We'd like to think it's successful. We have all of our kids going to college who want to play in college. And, um, you know, it's, we're just very fortunate to go out on the tennis court every day and have that be a full-time job. It's, it's funny even to call it a job, you know. So very, very lucky. 
Sure. And, you know, one of the things that I'm taking away from your story is the fact that you took this long break, this seven-year break from the game, and were still able to play in college and make a career out of playing tennis, um, well, teaching tennis. And I think for parents, it's important to hear that, that when our kids need a break from the game, from their training, from competing, whatever it is, it's not the end of their tennis career, you know, it's, it's just what it is, a break. And I think a lot of us, and, and I certainly was very guilty of this, you know, was so scared that if my child stepped away and, you know, didn't train for a week or, you know, didn't, didn't play a tournament for three weeks in a row that, oh, my God, he's never going to hit his goal of playing college tennis. And that's just not the case. No, I, I don't think it is. In fact, um, over the years, of course, you know, for every mistake you make, you, you learn 10 things. And um, I think I was the same way young and thinking, okay, we've got to do this. You've got you know, you to start at seven. You've got to start at eight. I don't believe that at all anymore. I, I think we can take a, a player who is a good athlete, can start the game uh, between 11 and 14 years old, maybe even older, depending. We, we saw, I forget the young lady's name at Wimbledon this last year who had, I forget, I can't remember her sport, but she'd played another sport and started playing tennis, and then she's at Wimbledon. I think that's more rare, but there are a lot of scholarships in America. There's a lot of tennis left to be played. And the average player who has some athletic ability, and then again, let's go back to the culture of that kid. If this child can listen, learn, and work, and enjoys what they're doing, supported by a family and a coaching system, then you can go a long ways. You can go and make this happen. I think there is more to lose in early specialization and there's more sure. opportunity to gain in late specialization and athletic development and being more well-rounded as a person and as an athlete. And we know that we know that scientifically yet people are still out losing their minds at the 12 and under tournaments that, that we'll see, you know, um, not yeah. certainly buying into the holistic or whole athlete approach as much as we would like. Well, and, and part of that, again, is fed by our governing body's junior comp system with the ranking points. And, you know, I was at an event in Atlanta a couple weeks ago. Um, I wrote about it that um, they chose the top three players from each of the participating states. So if you weren't the top three, or maybe it was the top two, I don't even remember now. But if you weren't, and this is a, a 10 and under event, So if you're not one of the top two or three players in your state at 10 and under, you're missing out on this opportunity. And I'm saying missing out with a smirk on my face because at 10 and under, you know, how many gajillions of opportunities lay ahead? I mean, tons of them. So so what if you miss this one? So what if you're not among the top two in the 10 and unders? But – It's tough, again, you know, when you're talking to parents, to help them understand that this isn't the end-all, be-all, that a ranking in the 10s or a ranking in the 12s isn't going to determine your child's tennis fate forever and ever. Yeah, I know, and it's very true. And I think on the player development side of things, um, and, you know, the Federation's broken into many factions, and I know everybody, you know, I can't speak for what's happening in the various boardrooms and meeting halls. I have some knowledge of it, but I know we keep trying to address it in various ways, and, and, I, and I want to be supportive of all of our efforts because I've been in player development. I know that player development efforts are exceptional. We're working hard. All the coaches that I went through PD with are incredible people. They're producing quality players. And what you said, I think, is the most important thing. Just because you miss a a Team USA camp in 10s and 12s, it's irrelevant if you're developing. I think what is relevant is do you have a training program that can make up the differences between why you didn't get there and why you may get there later? And that's really important to understand. That's why the educational opportunities, whether it's ITF or USTA or it's PTR, PTA, whatever body it is, or all of them, if, if you will, ITPA, the more education you get, the more likely as a coach you can hit on all your numbers and all your spots and all your competencies. 
And some coaches, without any of it, just have some exceptional eyes uh, and understanding they've done it. I think it's more rare these days than it used to be, though. But finding the right program, the right coach, and the right relationship that you can speak with your coach and he can, as I like to say, talk you off the ledge a little bit and say, hey, it's okay. They don't have to be here right now. But if you look at the video of the three players who made it in and where your young person is, why don't we try to hit on these spots and work on these things? And for the majority of the kids out there, I really think they can get there. It's, 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 more, the, it's more rare that the family culture doesn't allow it to happen, but it occurs. Or maybe it's just a, a relationship with a coach that's not the right fit right now. And, they, and everybody mm-hmm. needs to grow up and come around a little bit later. But I think understanding why we didn't hit the top three at that age, whether it's age and stage, uh, maturity, uh, technical or tactical development, once that's explained, and then and, 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 and segueing from there is we got to continue to put a lot of information out there about what it takes to develop uh, from 8 or 10 years old through 18. And, and how do we do that? Well, USTA has done a pretty good job, I think a really good job of, of putting a lot of information out there. I think Ann Pankhurst has done a ton of work in that area, um, putting out information on ages and stages. But I think more of it needs to go and be available at tournaments. Um, I think more parent talk opportunities. I know, you know, doing zonals this year, I did 10s and 12s and 14s last year, uh, did some Team USA camps. Um, there's almost always a coaching parent relationship or, or a federation parent talk of some sort discussing these things. And parents like yourself have been down the road before uh, passing on the knowledge and saying, hey, trust the process, uh, involving higher quality coaches, uh, asking them to educate more, getting them more opportunity. Um, yeah, I've been with PTR and ITPA a long time, so I can't speak for the others, and I think they're all great, but I know PTR does, in my mind, as good a job as anybody out there in giving opportunities for coaches to educate. And Mark Kovacs and, and ITPA have been so open and available uh, for me to learn and to to explain these pathways to parents, but also sometimes for me to understand them. Um, mm-hmm. But you know the websites. I think we could do more on the website. I think I, we could we could have a whole other podcast on just that on ways to help parents understand you know the the whole LTAD and and developmental pathways for young players trying to go from recreational to college. But, Jim, you know, you just touched on something that that I want to expand on a little bit, and that is, you know, these opportunities that are available for parents at zonals and at the training camps. But so that's another reason, I think, why families feel like if their child isn't tapped for these events, that they're really missing out. And one of the things that I've been pushing for since I started Parenting Aces and really even before that is we need these educational opportunities for parents at the entry-level events, not at the elite events. At the elite events, the parents already know this stuff. I mean, their kid's already there, you know. So it's, it's at the entry-level events where we, as a tennis community, need to do a better job at providing information and education to parents because I, I just got back from a tournament in Baltimore that, you know, that I helped put on. And we had kids playing in that event that this was their very first tennis tournament ever. And, you know, I they called me on the phone, and I had to talk them through even just registering for the tournament and then explaining to them what they needed to bring each day and explaining to them, you know, that your child needs to come check in at the desk and report his or her scores. You know, that's not your role as mom or dad. You know, your child needs to do this. No, please don't carry your, your little girl's tennis bag out to her court. She needs to do that, you know, and these types of things that parents just aren't educated on at the entry to the sport. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and I've actually said the same thing. I think there could be a lot more information available to them. I think, um, you know, there, there could be literature. USTA spends a lot of money. They do. They really spend a lot of money uh, giving kids opportunities. And I, and I've found, when I've spoken with various people in various positions that they're always open to these types of ideas and how do we implement them and, 
And I think to a certain degree it, it does help a lot when the coaches are involved in this type of thing or, or the referees. I was talking with a friend who's a referee the other day, and he was telling me that it's harder and harder to get referees and tournaments are, you know, their financial situations for tournament directors. There's a lot of challenge in front of us. But on the other side of things, there's, a, there's another part about the opportunity to be an exceptional athlete is an opportunity to be an exceptional athlete. It is not a privilege. So if you don't, the very thing that makes you great or may make you great is that when somebody tells you, like they did me, that you can't be on the kickball team when you're seven <laughs> and you don't get picked and you're picked last, it, it bothers you and hurts your feelings. And every time you fall down, you cry and you, you get scars and you get scabs and you get back up and you keep coming back in line you keep trying to play. And, and one day, one day maybe you could play for a college and you, you look up and you've been through all of these things. And, and it, it's a bit of a sociological cliche these days that everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets a chance. And I get that and I understand it. And in some ways I buy into it. But in other ways, I got to tell you, you got to get up. If you don't make it in, well, why don't you find a way to get in? Why don't you find a way to make your game better? I think that's really mm-hmm. an important part of what's going on right now at a lot of these events, everybody expects that they should be tapped or, you know, you're, you're not there yet. That's okay not to be there yet, but what are you going to do about that? Now, I do think not everybody has access to the coaching they may need. Um, but these days, even with YouTube and the, the Internet, there's so much information out there that, that's incredible how much knowledge there is. If you really want to do something well, then you'll, you're going to find a way. And that is part of the process of becoming an elite athlete is finding a way to persevere even though doors are closed for you. Because nobody nobody starts with an open door, right? But, um, you know, and I know they're front runners right away, of course. Right. No, I think those are excellent points, and I I hope my listeners will take those to heart and, and really think about it and how that can be applied in their own family situation because it, it's a huge issue. And, you know, one I faced multiple times with my kid and, you know, I think we, we all will likely come up against those obstacles in our life and we've got to learn how to pick ourselves up and, and get back on the horse. Oh, you know, <laughs> sure. Can you stay right briefly, along with you, Jim? <laughs> yeah. Well, briefly it's, it's sometimes today is not your day. Today is not your day, but that's okay because today doesn't have to, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be today for you. Maybe it's tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or three years from now. But if you're, if you're driven that you're going to succeed, and how many times have we heard this story in all aspects of life? But it's okay when today is not your day. Go home, eat some Cheerios, get some rest, get up in the morning and tie your shoes like an elite athlete ties their shoes. Get your helmet back on and get back out there. That's the lesson that needs to be taught. That's the lesson that keeps sending champions back to a tennis court. And I think that's an important yeah. lesson. Yeah, agreed. Well, I want to shift gears um, for our last little bit of the podcast and talk about your involvement with TennisMentors.net. On last week's show, I had Trent Bride and Patrick Kipson and Huge congrats to Patrick for winning Wim- uh, winning Kalamazoo. I just about said Wimbledon. That was weird. He almost um, won. He <laughs> was really close. He almost yeah. did. He did. Yeah, but he did win Kalamazoo, and he is getting that wild card into the U.S. Open. So huge congrats to him for that. But when I was talking with the boys about TennisMentors.net, they discussed their involvement with you as a partner. And I would love to hear from you why you decided you're so busy, you're already spread so thin, why you wanted to get involved with these young men and their efforts to give back to the next generation coming up behind them. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, First of all, I'm very impressed. Uh, with Trent and, and Patrick, and the idea I thought was, was exceptional. Um, I've known Trent's dad, Bruce, for many, many years, uh, known him to be a fine young man, his sister Carly. Um, these are just really quality people, exceptional idea, uh, exceptional people, um, exceptional ideals, what I was going to say. And then um, Patrick, I've unfortunately been on the back end of coaching against him on a few occasions. And I was like, gosh, what a player. <laughs> I actually really thought he was going to win Kalamazoo this year, and he did. So 
I'm, I'm excited I got that one right. Um, but here, here's young people who have been – this is the real reason, and all of those were important to me because I won't work with people who aren't good people. But those boys have a great idea. I call them boys. They're young men. I mean, they're, they're going to be on tour, it looks like, pretty soon. And um, what a fabulous idea to say, I've been on this road before. I'm not a coach. Their message is – it was funny because I was talking about their message a little bit. And um, their message is, I'm, I'm a player. I'm currently a player. I'm on the road. I've lost. I've been up 8-4 in a tiebreaker and lost a match. I've, I've turned my ankle. I've had my girlfriend break up with me. I, I've had all of these things. They're happening right now. They're relevant in my life. You know, as a coach, I'm 50 years old. I have lots of old stories to tell that my kids choose to tune out half the time, and it's okay because that's what they're supposed to do. But, you know, Trent came to visit us yesterday, and you could see my kids just looking right at him. He's one of them. The stories are relevant. A good person. Patrick's a great person. Great players. An exceptional idea. So for me, it was a no-brainer. Here's an opportunity that if I can help them and they can help the kids understand all the pieces, as we, you know, I've just you and I have just touched on a few of them in this podcast. All of the pieces that go into junior development. One more person to believe in them, uh, to shoot an email, to grab a hit. Um, you know, you couldn't ask for better people for the top 20 players in the world and juniors. So um, my hat's off to the guys for what I think is a brilliant idea and, um, and some really exceptional quality people. And we all know our young people need these type of folks in their life more often, you know. So that was the sure. reason that I got involved with them. Okay. And to my listeners, if you didn't listen to last week's episode of the podcast, please go back and do that. My interview with Trent and Patrick and, and their work on tennismentors.net. It's really cool. I mean, I, you know, when I first heard about it, I think it was on actually your Facebook page, Jim, you had posted something about it. I was like, Oh my gosh, I've got to get them on the podcast and hear more. And, um, you know, I just, I, I had interviewed Trent several times prior to that and was always very impressed with him as well. But, you know, this is, this is very cool. They're giving back to the game. They're offering, you know, their experience and expertise. What specifically is going to be your role with TennisMentors.net? Are you, you know, do you have a, a, a role in the business side of it and the tennis side of it, both? More, more advisory. Um, my, um, my advice to Trent was to keep it in the family for him. I thought he had a, a very, very good idea. Um, I'm in a position where I have a successful company and a successful program. Opportunities to revenue share, I'm confident, will be there in the future. But right now, you know, my advice to him is, is you guys are out to be the best players in the world. Uh, reach out to me if I can help you with any of the technical, tactical coaching part. But you have a relevant message to give one-on-one. Um, my position with them is just to facilitate opportunity and to help spread the word with fellow coaches all over the world to say, hey, these guys are traveling the world. And if you're in Canada and they're playing a tournament and you're there in B.C., let's say, and you know Patrick or somebody's going to be in town, sign up for a tennis mentor. Maybe they'll come in town a day early and hit with your kids or visit your academy, tell their story. Um, so for me, it's to help facilitate uh, what's going to happen next for them, maybe offer a little bit of advice here and there about what I've seen already and what I think would be the most relevant roles uh, for such a remarkable idea. I think you even said before, these are young, young men, and this is a very smart idea. But I think as, as busy as they are, um, just a voice to them that's a friend, and not somebody looking to make money off of their program. Let them get going. Let them do what they're going to do and, and just build some mutual trust and collaboration and see where the whole thing goes. But I, um, for me as a friend and advisor, I suppose, if we were going to give it a, uh, a name. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was very smart of them to reach out to you. I'm assuming they reached out to you and not vice versa. But, um, you know, I think it's great for them to have – a, an experienced coach, somebody who has coached kids to the highest level, to be there as a backup. And and interestingly, 
you've never been Trent's coach and you've never been Patrick's coach and you've never been Sam's coach and you've never been Gianni's coach, but you are there no, I have not. to help them now, right? So, I mean, right. pretty cool. Yeah, and, well, and again, happened, uh, go ahead. No, I just said it happened because one of my players had hit with him on something. He was started and the parent reached out. And when I heard about the idea, I said, uh, I would love to talk to him about it. And that's how we began. Mm-hmm. And, and just so, again, so the listeners know, right now it's four guys acting as mentors. But as they told me in the podcast last week, you know, the plan is to expand it to include female players. And, you know, and they are available to work with guys or girls. So they're not limiting, you know, their, their reach. Um, so if you're the parent of a daughter that would like a mentor, they're available. Yeah, no, and, and I think even to a greater extent and reach more kids at once, if you're a coach and you have a development program, these guys can come in and hit in with you and share stories, and, and they're for hire. They're going – they're professionals. They, this is a business idea. They're available to come in and, and give some relevant feedback, and the, the feedback Trent's already hit with a couple of bar players and met with our program and – he was spot on in everything he talked about. We were working on, on returns and recovery off return and serve and first ball and things like that. And, and here's a guy who's, who's basing his career on those things. And, and not only that, he's young, so it's, he, their, their charisma is exceptional. So if you're a coach around the country, you know, you really need to get on the phone with tennis mentors. Get on the website and find out where they're going to be and book these guys. And this is, this is a uh, huge asset to any program, and we should take advantage of these young American players. Uh, we need more young American players mentoring our future. And, and now they have a business, and they're available, and it's affordable, and it's smart. And, um, you know, clearly I'm a big supporter of it, and I'm excited about the future of it here for us. Well, and I think it's, you know, another aspect of this is for the four of them to be getting their names out. And name recognition is huge in our sport. You know, everybody knows Roger Federer. Everybody knows Serena Williams. But not everybody knows our young up-and-coming players' names and what they're about. And these young men are, are being very, very smart. They are marketing themselves not only as tennis players but as tennis mentors who can help the kids coming up behind them and they want to make sure that people know who they are and I think that is super super positive for the game and for tennis in America as a whole yeah and and I don't know Patrick's family as well or Sam or the other guys but you know I know Trent's very well and and this is a this is a really classy, remarkable, you know, great tennis family. They've they traveled and uh, sister played at Furman, and they were always at tournaments. And they're well behaved, and they were they, they stood out because they were well behaved. And and um, that's a shining example of you you can do this, and and you can make it all the way, and and have that type of interaction as a family, and really enjoy the road and. Gosh, Lisa, you know all the tournaments we travel to all over the country or all over the world, depending on your level. Um, and it can get difficult out there. So the more stories we have and the more people we have to fall back on, going back to some earlier questions, um, we really have the opportunity to fall back on these people for more information to give. The, and so here's Tennis Mentors with, with yet another great example of how you can get from, from the developmental stages to the top of the game. Uh, they're relevant and they're great stories. So I, I think it's another resource for us. And I want to point out that Sam is committed to playing college, so they can also advise on how to get to college and the whole you know process that's involved in recruiting and preparing for recruiting and all of that. So it's not just the kids that are on the path to become pro players. This, they also can assist for the kids that are on the college tennis pathway. Yeah, that's right. And, I, you know, congratulations to him. I think it's – is it Florida? Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, University of Florida. So, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic program. And, and um, he'll be a Gator, and, and you pass that on. I got kids – I have kids here in my program that would love to be a Gator one day and, or a Bulldog or, or what have you. And, um, you know – 
depending on which direction any of the boys are going and how many more girls and other people they're going to bring into their program, um, those are complicated pathways. There's a lot of recruiting. I get probably 30, 40 recruiting questions a year, and I'm heavily involved in helping get kids recruited. Um, so yet again, another great resource. Yeah, and we're going to have to chat again because we're coming to the end of our hour, and there's so much we haven't touched on, Jim. But um, now that I'm connected with you officially, uh, watch out because I'm going to be driving you nuts to come back on the podcast. <laughs> Well, hopefully you come visit us soon, Lisa. Thank you for your time. Yeah, sure. So if people want to find you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, you know, our website is uh, harptennis.com, H-A-R-P like the instrument, uh, harptennis.com, and all of our contact information is on there. I hope uh, most of it's up to date since I do it all myself. It may or may not be. But, um, you know, I'm a tennis coach. I go out every day. And I go on the court when it's uh, morning, and I come off when it's night. Um, So if you can't reach me that way, sometimes I think you just better better show up and say hi. Well, and we'll have the link to your website and um, your contact information from the website in the show notes. So to my listeners, you can check that out if you didn't jot down the site. But, um, Jim, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing so much valuable information with us today and for being available to us. And uh, I look forward to chatting again soon. Thank you so much, Lisa, and good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, visit us online at parentingaces.com. As always, a huge thank you to our sponsor, tennisballs.com.